It's time. Time to get credit for the work you've done. Time to get the recognition you deserve. With Purdue Global, you can move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself. You're worth the investment in yourself to earn a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will respect. Purdue's online university is designed to support working adults like you who know it's never too late to accomplish your goals. It's never too late to make a comeback. It's time to start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. This episode is brought to you by Navy Federal Credit Union. It's a special thing to be a member of Navy Federal because they are a member-owned, not-for-profit credit union that invests in its members with amazing rates and low fees. That's why members could earn and save more every year. Plus, they serve all branches of the armed forces, veterans, and their families. So if you're interested in becoming a member, learn more at NavyFederal.org. At Navy Federal Credit Union, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA. Episode 325, Step-by-Step Guide to Values-Based Spending. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast, where you'll learn to save money, money, embrace simplicity, and live a richer life. Here are your hosts, Jen and Jill. Welcome to the Frugal Friends Podcast. My name is Jen. My name is Jill. And today we have a special episode for you. We are doing things... A little differently. We are not including any articles. Curveball. This is going to be a sole, like, a step-by-step guide that we are creating. And we're excited about it, and we hope it goes over (laughs) well. Give us a little grace. (laughs) Whether or not you want original thought, it's what you're getting, not curated commentary. Um, Yes. We'll see how, how it goes. Traditionally, we will we will curate articles and comment on them with original thought, but this is a hundred percent original thought. So, kind of with all the influences that we've had over the last thirty four years of life. Yes, yes. So, first, this episode is brought to you by books. Ooh. Books. Uh, You don't need to spend thousands of dollars on courses and coaching programs to learn how to improve your life and finances. All the wisdom you seek can be found for $30 or less in books. We love books. We know you do. That's why we've always had a Frugal Friends book club in some iteration. Our first piece of merch was a bookmark. One of our only pieces of merch. (laughs) A bookmark. Uh, So it's with earth-shattering excitement that we can announce we're writing writing a a book! book! It It has been a lifelong dream of mine, Jen, to traditionally publish a book. And the fact that I get to do it with one of my best friends and we're writing about a topic that we think is going to change so many lives. It's going to take away so much guilt and shame when it comes to spending money, budgeting, saving. This is more of a dream than I could have ever imagined. So books, Mm -hmm. we love them and we hope you'll love our book. We're hyping you up for something that you won't actually be able to get your hands on until early 2025, but we can't contain ourselves. And if you want to know when you actually can sink your teeth into this goody, goody goodness, uh, sign up for our newsletter, frugalfriendspodcast.com slash friend letter. Yes. And you'll get all kinds of goodness leading up to the final time when you can buy our book. Absolutely. Uh, So that is one of the reasons we're doing this special episode. We'll do a couple special episodes throughout the rest of the year to gauge interest in the content that we are putting into the book. We've, I mean, we've written a 60 page proposal. That is how our book, our book got bought. So we know that it's, it's interesting. We already know that values based spending is the thing you love most about what we talk about. And so we've kind of created a book 
about that. And we're just going to, we're kind of throw out ideas to you in these episodes, kind of summing up things we talk about in all of our episodes, but kind of dedicating whole episodes to them. And so we would love, love, love if you are hearing this episode anytime in the next year. <laughs> And you have some feedback about, oh, when you said this, uh, it was yes, absolute yes. Or when you said this, I kind of felt this too. Or any feedback that you have that can help us really dig into what's going on in your head as you listen to us talk about this stuff or any experiences that you feel like relate please email us. Let us know. You can email me directly, jen at frugalfriendspodcast.com. And and let us know. We want to hear your feedback because this book is for you. And it is for the people in your life. It's for, it's a love letter to all of you. And that's Mm. literally what we said in the book proposal. It's a love letter to you. And I think that's what sold it. (laughs) I hope so. I hope so. So please, we would love your your feedback in whatever way so that we could just make this book as helpful and great and relevant as possible. So yes. love that. So let's talk books. about this. Yeah. Values based spending is gonna be all throughout this book. And so we wanna give just a really foundational episode on it, explain what it is how you can get at it. We've spent a lot of time saying, oh, there's no quick 12-step process that you can do over the weekend and click into values-based spending. That said, there are some steps that we can take, and Mm -hmm. we want to give you that blueprint and format in this. And and so there's no articles, unfortunately, about this. Someday there'll be a book about it, but (laughs) it's just going to be Jen and I telling you what is values-based spending. In the way that we want to see them written. Mm-hmm. And when when you don't have that, then you propose a book. And, and so, yeah. And so this is, a, we feel like we have said this so often, but we don't actually have an episode fully dedicated to. We have, how do you find your values? And what is values-based budgeting? And so this is our bread and butter episode for values-based spending. So get us started, Jen. What is values-based spending? So values-based spending is spending in alignment with the things that matter most to you and not spending on the things that you don't care about as much. So there's this great quote by David Allen, who's the creator of the Getting Things Done productivity system. And he said, you can do anything, but not everything. And it's the same with spending. You can value anything. Nobody can tell you what is good to spend on and what is bad to spend on. There is a lot of judgment out there from people uh, who will judge you for spending on one thing or another. And unfortunately, in the frugal community, we tend to be the most judgmental about what people spend on. Um, but we're trying to break that stigma. Spending is not the enemy. Spending is neutral. And there is nobody that can tell you what's right to spend on. You can value spending on anything, but not everything. You do not value everything. Because when everything is important, it diminishes the importance of the things that truly matter. And often we have found that those things aren't things you can spend on. Those are things money can't buy, like time freedom and the preservation of natural resources and and you know all of these other things that yes require money but are actually peripheral to money yeah so that's values based spending i think out the gate too i want to dispel a little bit of maybe even how i thought about values based spending when i when when we first kind of phrased it this way and came upon this idea throughout the evolution of our own frugal journey. And I think it can give this impression that every single dollar we spend is only on the things that are just 
fun or or the things that it, maybe it's only discretionary spending, but this can also include fixed expenses. Certainly, it's going to play into, we're going to see it show up more and more when we are making decisions with our discretionary income of, should I make this impulse purchase or not? Should I go on this vacation or not? Should I do something different? But it does also play into our fixed expenses, our living, our transportation. Now, we might not be making daily decisions about how they align with our values, but at some point in time, it will behoove us to look at that and consider how does living in this area or in this particular house or in this school zone align with my values? How does having two or three vehicles align with my values? How does having this particular vehicle, all of these things kind of come into play. It it makes me think about Marie Kondo's whole thing about minimizing and how she received pushback on only keeping things that spark joy. It's like, well, sometimes I just need a rubber scraper for when I'm cooking. And so, yeah, you might not be able to exactly say why there is joy in a rubber scraper, but you can connect it to the fact that maybe you enjoy cooking nutritious meals for your family. And so having a good quality rubber scraper is what brings you joy. I think very similarly when we're talking about values-based spending, it might not be that, oh, I value this particular vehicle, but I value safety or I value going to and from this this location that I've chosen to live in because I love it to my work. There's always something that I think we can get at the deeper level, but it will certainly bear in impact on our day in, day out choices on what we spend on and bring a greater level of awareness to our spending, which increases our understanding of self and decreases guilt and shame that can often coincide our finances. Some other things that I've also noticed with values-based spending is that sometimes it will mean finding permission to spend. As we understand ourselves more, we feel more confident in our spending, then we don't have that kind of icky feeling of, oh, I really shouldn't be spending this, or why am I doing this, or this feels impulsive, but whatever, push it aside. That diminishes and ultimately can really nearly go away when we've really aligned our spending with our values. What it also means is sometimes cutting back. When we've given ourselves permission to say yes to the things that we know deep down we value, it's going to be such an easy no, not for the sake of deprivation, but it can mean getting really good at cutting back on the things we don't value, which is also a part of this process, learning what that is. Sometimes we might think we value something and then we enter into this journey and discover, oh, I actually don't care about that at all. So that's an easy no for me. What I've also realized is that sometimes values-based spending means that you're finding you don't need to spend at all, even on the things that you value, which could create this space for contentment and less and learning what is enough. I know we will often talk about increasing our income, decreasing expenses, and that can certainly be a part of this. But it's very possible that as we're on this journey, we get to the point where we discover, oh, I don't actually have to earn more than this amount because I've discovered a life that I love leading. I'm able to spend on the things that I enjoy and this is enough and it gives me more space, more freedom, more time to enjoy the things that I'm realizing I love and it's not costing me anything. Mm -hmm. When we started thinking about the book, we actually started with this concept of what is enough? Because if you don't decide what enough is, nothing will ever be enough. And it it can sometimes be a double-edged sword that you, you want to strive for more. You don't want to be complacent, but you don't want to be so, not am, um, ambitious, but lose so much sight of the bigger picture that you lose sight of what enough is for you. And that can change throughout the seasons. And values-based spending really gives you the opportunity to define what is enough. Uh, And again, can change throughout your life, throughout your seasons. It will change. Right. Without that baseline to say, oh, this is what will get me to all those things that I really truly want, plus 
you know, extra for spending on fun things, impulse things, what what have you. Once you can get there, you have a lot more freedom and you can actually strive in ways that maybe you didn't know that you could before. When you have a goal, you can always strive for more. Uh, So I love that about values-based spending. Something that we have really refined in our view of values-based spending over the years is what is a value? What is a core value? What is a thing you value spending money on? And at first, we really focused on actual core values. So achievement, community, beauty, generosity, stuff like that. And while those are great things to know about yourself, like what are my core values? How do I want to show up in the places that I care about? And how can I show up best? If one of my core values and who I know to be is somebody who loves community, then it's it's much easier for me to make life decisions that affect my finances. Like, I don't want to be a digital nomad because I want to be rooted somewhere uh, with a community versus meeting new people all the time. That is a life decision, but obviously affects finances. In our day-to-day in spending, there's not so much need for for that. Core values are for, for big financial expenses where I think in the day-to-day, you just need to know kind of what you value spending on in general. Like I will, I don't eat at sit-down restaurants very often because I don't value that, Uh, but I know I hate dishes, so I'll get takeout and I'll never turn down getting a latte because I love them. Um, I love not having to make my own. So it's stuff like that. That is, there's no core value in me that that would lead to why I love buying lattes out and don't love sit-down restaurants. But there are two values, both important to know, but different. Yeah. And so when we think about why is values-based spending important, I think we've been able to define what it is, but why is this something that we are saying is almost this watermark that or umbrella that we can take into the rest of life. And a big part of it is because spending is a skill. We are, I think, expected to enter the world in adulthood and know how to spend. And yet most of us have never actually been taught how to spend well, even with having Frugal Friends podcast, five years in, people still expect us just to talk about how to save, how to cut, how to live with less, how to deprive. And I'm not saying that there's none of that. We do talk about those things, but not to the exclusion of spending. Even the most frugal, cutting, even borderline cheap person needs to spend money. And if we're not good at it, then all of the cutting is hardly going to do much for our financial trajectory. And so learning how to spend well, spend wisely, spend with intention, good stewarding spending, we are going to be better off for it, not just in our financial life, but all of the rest of our personhood. And values-based spending is one of those tools, overarching mindsets that we can pick up and help us to understand our spending rhythms and patterns, what it means about us and how we can spend better in a way that's going to ultimately benefit us. That's the, that's the whole goal here is integration of financial self with the rest of who we are. Our physical, emotional, relational, mental selves is connected to our financial self. And we feel as though this values-based spending piece is one of those missing puzzle pieces to bringing about that alignment, that connection, that understanding of our whole person. How do we move through the world, make good spending decisions that are related to all other aspects of our being. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power. So how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. 
OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing. And of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash strategic. That's oracle.com slash strategic. oracle.com slash strategic. We know New Year's resolutions often don't stick. In fact, on average, they last around 30 days. So if saving money is on your 2024 resolution list, here's a foolproof way to stick to yours. Switch your phone provider to Mint Mobile. For a limited time, wireless plans from Mint Mobile are $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. That's unlimited talk, text, and data for $15 a month. For those of you paying close to 40 bucks a month for just one phone line, this means a savings of $300 over the course of the year. We especially like Mint because all plans come with unlimited talk and text and high-speed data delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month unlimited wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash frugal. That's mintmobile.com slash frugal. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash frugal. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Mm-hmm. Yeah, values-based spending creates the freedom to spend. We all consume. Consuming is part of life. You consume food. You consume space in this world. And you consume products via money. It takes money to consume things. And that's healthy. As we grow um, in life, and we consume more and more. And again, that's healthy. But where we miss the mark is is we want to be able to do it well. We don't want to be afraid of it. And we also don't want to overindulge in it. So there's this radical middle in the in the center. And people very much think like spending well means spending all your money. Oh, yeah, I spend real well. I have zero dollars in my bank account <laughs> by the next paycheck. I got no problem spending. But spending well doesn't mean going broke. Spending well means that you are spending on the things you care about uh, and have margin to be able to afford the things you care about later in life, too, because we don't want to be working our entire lives. Even if we do want to be working in some capacity, you probably don't want to be doing what you're doing now for the rest of your life. You, you will transform. And and maybe you won't, but we want to set you up to be able to have the freedom to choose what you want when you want to choose it. Uh, so I love that about it. And it, it helps us better understand ourselves, uh, which is a benefit to all aspects of our personhood, not just our finances. When you can, I, I, there are so many times where I used to make a budget and I would put lattes on it. I would say, okay, I'm going to $20 for coffee this month. And I would be scared to spend it. Like I had budgeted for it and I still felt like some guilt for spending in the budget. Uh, and then I would hate that feeling and I would just throw the budget away altogether because I I didn't want to make myself feel guilty. Uh, other people can make me feel that, but I'm not going to make myself feel that. Uh, and so when you can understand like, oh, this is this is good for me to spend on just because somebody else is telling me not to spend on it. I don't have to listen to them because it's probably not what they value, but it's what I value. And now that I understand that about me, I can say no to other things and I can spend on what I love without guilt. And not only helping us understand ourselves better, it also helps us relate to others, understand others around us better when we can reframe our understanding of finances from this values-based perspective. It gives us new, meaningful, rich language to put to conversations around finances where we can recognize the deeper meaning often associated with money. For me, coming from the mental health field and having provided 
therapy and counseling sessions to individuals and couples, one of the things that I realized throughout that season in engaging with people at this level was very often the conflicts that they would come to me with wanting to be able to process it out, receive tools to do better with their relationships, experience more health and connection and intimacy with one another. It wouldn't necessarily be the very problem they were coming with. It it had to do with values. It had to do with spending of capacities. So we don't just spend money. We spend relational capacity, emotional capacity, mental capacity. And so, you know, let's say there was a couple who came to me with not appreciating how one another chooses to spend their time. He's always out doing whatever he wants to do, fixing up whatever, and she's always out with friends and, you know, we're we're not connecting in the ways that I think we should be connecting. It's not necessarily about him doing what he's doing outside, her doing what she's doing with her friends. It's what what's at the core of this what's the value here and and so the same thing with money can often happen where i don't like how my partner is spending on this and they don't like how i'm spending on xyz and we can experience this massive barrier in moving forward and gaining headway in resolving this conflict coming to some sort of mutual agreement if we're not having conversations at the deeper level and being curious with one another of what is this connected to, though? What is it that draws you to spend in this way, whether it's money or time? What is this providing to you? What What is the meaning that's attached to that? Often when we pull it away from the actual thing itself, you spent on this and look at, but what did this give to you? How does this connect to who you are, your personality, the things that you enjoy gives us so so much more insight into ourselves and one another and really gives such a beautiful playground for conversation then of, I didn't know that about you or, oh yeah, that does actually make sense with what I do know about you. And then there's negotiation that come in, can come into place where there's understanding and mutual agreement and space given to one another. So the, this values-based framework helps us, again, not only know ourselves, but one another another and can create such beautiful space for conversation where now there's room for one another and not just rigid sets of rules that lack understanding and continue to throw us into this pattern of conflict and relating that is not benefiting us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's that is in a nutshell values-based spending and why we we value, (laughs) no pun intended, (laughs) It's so much. So let's get into kind of the framework for how do you practice values-based spending? This is something we have gone back and forth on and kind of refined over the last three-ish years that we have been really interested in this. And we think we've gotten it to kind of a really good, simple overview. Obviously not extensive, but if you're wanting to adopt it, it's going to be a really great start. Values-based spending is not something that you can like fully master because as we grow and change, our values grow and change. So you think you've got it and then it changes. And then you have a second baby. Right? (laughs) (laughs) So then we have to reevaluate ourselves. Like achievement was something that was really important to me before I had kids. And now that I've had my second, I am really reevaluating what I value out of life. And so you will always be reevaluating. But if you can go back to these four-ish steps, um, then you can, can really, again, start to kind of re-hone, refine what you're doing with your spending and really get a grasp on it and feel good about what you're spending money on. How many people can say like, I feel really good 
about what I spend money on. Like I spend money on what I love. I can say no to the things that I don't. And I have money left over. I'm saving, investing so that I can spend better and well in my future. Mm. Yes. That can be you. Yes. Let's let's make it us. So first things first, you're going to need to figure out what you're spending on. This is going to be the first step for getting better with spending, saving our finances, feeling more confident. You need to figure out where is your money currently going. We recommend going back and looking at your 90-day spending history. This is going to include your discretionary spending as well as your bills. We can't pretend like they're not a thing or a part of this financial picture. So go back through all of your, whether you put your expenses on credit cards or debit cards, or it comes out automatically, gather it all up. You can do this digitally, but if you love printing things out, feel free to do that too. And look back over the last three months. And the reason we say three months, 90 days, is because month to month, things change. Each month typically brings a new, often unexpected expense. Each month doesn't look the same as the previous months. We've got various birthday parties or weddings or bills unexpected or irregular types of bills that happen. And so that 90 days is going to help get us a more clear picture of where does our money go most of the time. And so once you've got that actual physical list of where your money has gone, we're going to want to look at this with a little bit more of a curious lens. Not critical of ourselves, not judgmental, just putting on our curious George hat to ask ourselves some questions about these transactions. We can look at it almost like a fun financial journal where we are considering what triggered this spend? Did it give me the result that I wanted? What was going on for me? We can even dig a little deeper of what was the environment? Do I remember what I was feeling emotionally? What happened for me relationally that day? What is going on for my entire personhood as each of these expenses happen? You may not be able to answer all of those questions in grave detail, but as much as you can, we really want to take a deeper dive as we are practicing curiosity with with ourselves. This is an exercise in learning more about who we are, which will ultimately lead to understanding our values. But it's going to have to start here first of really looking at what do I choose with my finances? Yeah. And this is going to take a while to do. It's not something you're going to be able to sit down in an hour, print off your 90-day spending history, and then next to each transaction, what triggered it? And did I get the result I want? Like, did it make me, did it fulfill me? Did it make me happy? You know, all these things. You're not gonna be able to do it in an hour. So don't be scared to like move on and and keep growing before you finish this, but make it a priority to finish because it will give you the solid foundation you need to make change. But don't procrastinate. I call it procrastinating spending, but it's procrastinating on, on anything. We think we need to like master the first step before we can move on to all the like steps that follow it. I stop doing that and, and good enough is okay. Uh, you can get through it, get some under your belt and, and keep moving on while you continue working on this first step. It, it may take you like a week or two, depending on your schedule, but it is really important to, before you change what you're spending on, you need to get a baseline of what you're already spending on. Because we, when you make a budget, you want to make a perfect budget. You know, you want uh, your numbers to say, oh yeah, like this is how much I should be spent, quote unquote, should be spending on groceries. When in reality, maybe you're spending twice that and it's unreasonable to think that you can cut your grocery bill in half in one month. Uh, You got to know where you're at so that you can start moving towards where you want or you can even decide if where you think you should be is actually where you want to be. You can consider other options, but first you need to figure out where you are. So the, the second step, you can choose what you value. 
So once you make that list of transactions and you make a note for each one, and and this is, again, with bills too. Honestly, like if you are paying a mortgage that is huge and you have housing bills and appliance replacements and all of these things that come with home ownership, when you really want to be traveling and and doing these things that don't align with home ownership, you need to question if that mortgage is giving you the result you want in life. So don't just do it with discretionary. Do this with your bills too figuring out, okay, what triggered this spend? So like, what was I doing? What was I feeling? Stuff like that. And did it give me the result I want? Did it really fulfill what I had desired? Once you do that for all of your purchases, then you can choose from that list, like what are the things that did give me the result I want? So, and, and they can be different. So like, for example, lattes. One latte could be giving you time with a friend, which is something you really value, while another latte could just have been a habit purchase. Like you, whenever you go visit your mom, you pick up a latte along the way. You don't know why you don't need it. Just, it just, it's habit. Stuff like that can be the same purchase, but for different reasons. And that's why it's important that we make a note of like what triggered the expenses so that you can get an idea of like, okay, maybe next time when I go see my mom, I just don't pick up a latte. But when a friend asks me to coffee, I say yes without hesitation. Again, lattes aren't the enemy. The purchase is not the enemy. The knowing why you're doing it is the goal. Mm. So that's the next step. So, and you can decide today on a few things that you value. You won't have an extensive list. You don't have to have the perfect list of your values, but you can decide today like lattes with friends. That's a no-brainer for me. I'm always going to say yes to that and and feel confident about that. Which I think is why this is so fluid and so difficult to really nail down as far mm-hmm. as here's exactly how you do values-based spending because it is different for all of us. And week to week, month to month, year to year, it may be different for us as well. It's not to the exclusion of what's incoming. We're not just spending and not and ignoring what we're making and bringing in and what is actually affordable. But we're recognizing, yeah, that one, the purchase of the same thing one day could be in total alignment with our values and another day may not be. And so there's, again, so much of this is rooted in just our understanding of self. So then from there, you're going to move into asking a very similar question, only the opposite. Decide what you don't value. What transactions, as you look over that 90-day list, you didn't enjoy, didn't give you what you wanted, weren't actually in alignment with now what you have decided in your step two, you do value. So some examples of this could be, as you look back over these expenses, where might have you felt pressured to buy or contribute? What might have been an impulse buy and maybe just the the act of purchasing itself provided you something in the moment, but the thing is nowhere to be found and you kind of want to return it. Go ahead and return it. Or the purchase was influenced by some unattainable standard, something you saw on social media. You're being sold and told this is the next step, even down to what you said already, Jen, of mortgage. Some of us could be in home-owning situations just because we've been sold this narrative that that's the next step in adulthood. But truly for you, you would rather low maintenance, free up time and money for these other things, time with your family, travel, the ability to be flexible, you name it. That's totally a fine adult decision. It doesn't mean that you are some young adult living some frivolous life. There are plenty of 
older, wise individuals who have chosen renting as a lifelong living, lodging solution, and it is wisdom for them. So Mm -hmm. feel the freedom, even on these larger things, that we we can challenge these ideas and we can decide, I actually don't value owning a home. I actually don't value having two cars. I actually don't value spending half my Saturday mowing my lawn every weekend. And that's a decision that might take a little bit longer than deciding deciding, yeah, I'm okay spending, like buying lattes every week. But I think Eve, every single one of these purchases we can look at with this lens of, is there anything here that I don't value, isn't giving me what I want, isn't creating this the space for the things that truly do matter for me, that might become an easier and easier no for me. Mm-hmm. And the more you do this, the more you can get creative with how you say yes and how you say no. So to use the example of home ownership again, maybe if you if you find that you don't want to be a homeowner anymore, that doesn't automatically mean you have to sell your house. You could potentially rent it out and go rent somewhere else or or be wherever you truly want to be um, and, and be a renter. And, and there are all these options when you start getting curious about what you've assumed is set in stone. When you take that off the table, you can start to ask questions and you can start to investigate because a no doesn't automatically mean a yes and a yes doesn't automatically mean a no there are areas in the middle. Um, And it's just taking the time to question if something is an absolute or if something's negotiable. So the next step, and I would say same as when you choose what you value, when you decide what you don't value, decide that day on a few things you'll never spend on again. Things that are easy no's, write them down. Like for me, when I realized I love to go out and get a cocktail with friends at happy hour, but I actually don't like beer that much. Like I can drink it, but it's it's usually just a thing that I get when there's nothing else available. I decided that day, like, I don't buy beer anymore. Like, that is an easy no for me. Uh, So it's it's like some simple things like that. Decide a few of them. Write them down. Never spend on them again. And then once you've done that, step four is to put barriers up to prevent disaligned spending. So it is a lot easier to, once you've figured out what you value, to keep spending on that. Um, It is not as easy when you decide what you don't value to stop spending on that stuff. Sheer willpower can get you started, but it isn't enough to learn and master a skill. Any athlete will tell you that. Any person who's adopted a habit will tell you that. So you need to get acquainted with this mindset of curiosity and and start to learn physical and mental shortcuts that will help you say no when saying no is hard. And this is a lifelong journey of learning, learning these different quote unquote life hacks, but but they are just smart mental shortcuts, physical shortcuts um, or barriers that will help you in this journey. Uh, Because I'm sure anybody who has made a budget and not stuck to it has questioned like, why am I not sticking to this? I say I want to do this. The math is mathing, but I can't, I can't connect. And that's where this comes in is because math isn't enough to make you follow through the thought that this is where I should be when I'm in my 30s financially, or or this is where I should be, I should be able to do this, that's not going to get you through. Learning the ways to refine your actions is what's going to get you through. It's not deprivation. It's refining this skill of spending is what is going to get you through. And sprinkled throughout this, 
and going forward is all of these other tools and tips and hacks and resources that we've talked about. Sprinkled throughout here is a spending plan or budget, if you're still old school and you don't mind that B word. (laughs) And thinking about investing for retirement and savings goals and giving goals and spending goals and how you how you spend your time and how we incorporate new and better habits and how we aim at well-being in all aspects of our personhood all throughout here is then these tools that we pick up at different points in time different stages of life that will fit us that will suit our needs for that time for that season for the goal that we're identifying and this is ongoing if there were to be a step five in all of this, it would be refining, honing, revisiting, because as we've said many times, this does change and shift. Life circumstances, seasons, living situations shift. And we are allowed to steal Jen's phrase. We're allowed to throw him a plot twist. We're allowed to change our minds. We are allowed to move in a different direction and decide this is now in more alignment with what is important to me at this stage of life. And so it is going to be important to not just set it and forget it, but to be an active participant in the life that we're living. Wouldn't that be amazing? And then to feel so good and confident and free in the decisions that we're making because we know it so well now. We've done the work. We know what we value, and we are constantly revisiting that idea and wondering, okay, I did this thing. This used to bring value to me a year ago. Is it still? If yes, great, keep going. If no, hmm, what changes can I be implementing? And what's going to happen here is decreased guilt and shame across the board and a deeper increased understanding of ourself, which will, again, not only benefit us in our financial life, but every aspect of our life. I think what what we have found and what many of the people in our community are indicating they're finding is that as they're improving one aspect of life, we are noticing benefit to other aspects of life. It's a really amazing peripheral impact of well-being that really can happen in in any part of our personhood, right? We start exercising and then we notice that our focus on nutritional goals is getting better or our relational capacities are improving or we're focusing on our financial health and we're paying down debt. And we're also noticing that our impulse spending is getting under control and we are spending more quality time with the people that matter. And now we're interested in what else can I be incorporating that's going to be good for me because I feel like I'm on a roll here. And of course, the opposite happens too, right? When we are experiencing not so great and beneficial habits for ourselves, it almost wraps all the other aspects of our personhood and brings it down with it. But it works in the opposite direction too. So leveraging this to our benefit, getting better in one area, and then just reaping the benefits of it, improving quality of life in these other areas. It's so fun. Mm -hmm. And the majority of the book is spent in this this fourth step, um, is these barriers and these sub-skills that help you practice values-based spending. It'll take you a few weeks to do steps one through three, to do the 90-day spending history, decide what you value, decide what you don't. And then we get into this practice of practicing. Uh, and we this is where we get lost because practicing is really practice over and over and over. Uh, But we get so discouraged when I, you know, have learned about values-based spending. I know what I value. I know what I don't value. And for some reason, I keep falling back into these impulse spending binges, even though I know this stuff is stuff I don't value. So you give up on it. And that's what we're trying to prevent. And so throughout the book, there are nine principles that are really going to be the foundation of the practice of values-based spending. When you 
know these principles, even if you just know a couple of them, it makes practicing it so much easier. But we're giving you all nine uh, so that you can really master the skill throughout your lifetime and put up these barriers or just make it simpler, make it easier to say the yes or say the no. We're giving you nine so you can be the 10. The dime piece. The dime 10 out of 10. And you know what else is practice? It's just practice. But that we don't get lost in it, and it no. brings us back, and it's encouraging, and it is aligned with our values. It's the Bill of the Week! That's right. It's time for the best minute of your entire week. Maybe a baby was born, and his name is William. Maybe you paid off your mortgage. Maybe your car died and you're happy to not have to pay that bill anymore. Duck bills, Buffalo bills, Bill Clinton. This is the Bill of the Week. Hi, Jen and Jill. This is Emily calling with my Bill of the Week. And this one is for all of the pet parents out there. And my tip is to buy those routine prescriptions for our furry friends through Chewy. I was previously buying my dog's flea and tick medication from the vet, and at $26 a dose, I was looking at $330 each year. I found out that the doses are um, cheaper through Chewy, and by buying those in bulk and taking advantage of a one-time discount, I was able to bring the bill down to $186, and that is a $145 savings annually. So if you have not um, found out that you can buy your prescriptions through Chewy, I would highly recommend giving it a shot. I love the podcast, and thanks for all you do. Thank you. Yay, Emily. This is so exciting. We love it when people find a way to cut expenses while still caring for the things that you value. So this is amazing. Well done that you are getting all of your preventative medicines for your furry friends and saving $145 Mm -hmm. annually. It sounds like you're still getting the exact same medications that you needed just at a discounted rate, which is hopefully freeing up money for other things that you enjoy. That'd be fun. And Chewy, this one's free, yeah, but the next welcome, one's going to cost you. <laughs> yep. If you have a bill you want to share about something you value spending on, but you found it at a discounted rate, or you've got a furry friend named Bill, oh man, I'd love for like a little hamster or a little goldfish named Bill. That's hilarious. Visit frugalfriendspodcast.com slash bill. Leave us your bill. We all agree that reducing carbon emissions is a good thing. And once again... Toyota is leading the way. We hear a lot about fully electric vehicles, and Toyota has them, with more on the way. But we also know a BEV is not for everyone, whether it's because of cost, range, or concern about finding a charging station when you need it. Plus, the raw materials used to manufacture batteries are limited. Enter Beyond Zero, Toyota's vision for a carbon-neutral future, in vehicles and in manufacturing plants, too, in the years ahead. The materials used to make just one long-range battery for an EV could be used to make batteries for six plug-in hybrids or 90 gas-electric hybrids. That's why Toyota's position today is Electrified Diversified, empowering you to choose how to reduce your own carbon footprint with the vehicle that's right for you, a hybrid, plug-in hybrid, or battery EV. So shop, learn more, and get details at toyota.com slash beyond zero. Toyota, let's go places. It's never too late. Never too late to earn a degree. Never too late for a comeback. Between your busy career and taking care of a family, it can feel like there's never a good time to go back to school. But your time is now. Time to start your comeback with Purdue Global. As Purdue's online university for working adults, 
Purdue Global is dedicated to supporting adults like you who know it's time to earn the recognition you deserve. You have the experience. You have the knowledge. It's time to get credit for the work you've done. You can balance work, family, and everything in between while earning your degree. It's time to move forward in your career, for your family, and for yourself with a degree you're proud of, a degree that employers will recognize and respect. You're worth this investment in yourself to earn a degree you deserve. It's never too late. Never too late to go back to school and come back stronger with an education you can trust. Now is the time for your comeback. Start yours today at purdueglobal.edu. And now it's time for <gasps> the lightning round. <laughs> The Pew. lightning round is going to be in the book. And yeah, don't you worry. I am really thinking that we need the book to be one of those kid push button books for the sound no. effects just for this. There's one button. It's the lightning <laughs> round. And whenever you need it or want it, you've got these sound effects right in your face. Yeah. How about we put a lightning round like sound effect button on our website? So if people want to read it in tandem, <laughs> like they can or we'll do it on the audiobook. There'll be a QR code right yeah. below the lightning <laughs> round. Every single time they can we can't scan the QR that. code. If you want it though, <laughs> let us know and we'll pass it on to the publisher. We're you just gotta really want it. right yeah. now on the mic you, spitballing. Again, please let us know what you want, um, <laughs> what you need. And maybe it's sound effects. Yes. The audiobook's going to be fun, for sure. So in this edition of The Lightning Round, uh, we're going to give personal examples of values-based spending. Actually, the, the Lightning Round in the book, we're wanting it to be your vulnerability. So we want you to get vulnerable with yourself. So it's going to be questions that help you get vulnerable. Because we always say the lightning round is like our vulnerability segment. Uh, so we are we want you to get vulnerable with you or your book club, wherever you're reading. Uh, so Jill, what are mm. your personal examples of values-based spending right now? Hey, oh, well, you know, if you've listened <laughs> for a time, my values at this stage of life are connection, community, that's kind of all one, beauty, and generosity. There's so much for me that connects to that. Sometimes it means spending on those things, and sometimes it doesn't. I can get a lot of those things for free, which is excellent. But related to the community and beauty piece, is travel for me. So I really enjoy seeing new places, exploring, adventuring. It usually does include seeing some beautiful places. It often includes hikes, being out in nature, wherever it is that I'm going to. And so I will spend on travel, which does cost a lot. It costs more than staying home. <laughs> but it makes it easy to say no in other areas to create room in our spending plan for travel. And I'm not traveling as much as I used to, but it's still important to me to make space for those new experiences. I love international travel. So one of the things that we've done in our lives, Eric and I, is go down to having one vehicle. We are in part able to do that because we both work from home, but we have chosen for the last three plus years, maybe even going on four years, to just have one vehicle. That frees a lot of money up in our finances to be able to throw some extra money towards a sinking fund of travel. For us, we're also in a season of renovating our house. We are nearly at the tail end of it, which is so fun. And this in some ways aligns with my value for beauty. I want the space that I live in to feel comfortable and beautiful and clean. And so I only know that it's clean if I am able to rip out all of the drywall and bug proof it and insulate it and then re-drywall it and paint it and caulk it 
and wood fill it myself. It's extreme. Uh, but we've created space in our budget for it. And I don't know what's going to happen once renovations are over and it frees up some of our money. But for the time being, we have said a lot of no's to going out to eat, which we love going out to eat in part because we love being around friends. And that's a fun thing to do with friends. But we have said no to going out. Yes to friends coming over or going over to friends' houses. So we're not giving up connection with people. But for this season, we are eating most of our meals at home so that we can say yes to creating a home that we feel is beautiful. And again, we will refine and hone. We're going to come into a new season where we're not doing renovations, where maybe going out to eat will become a more regular part of our rhythm. But these are the values-based choices we are making currently. What about you, Jen? Mm -hmm. So for me, I talk about lattes and I'm a walking stereotype. Uh, But uh, yeah, I really, (laughs) I mean, I don't go out to eat a lot. It's not something that I, I'm not a foodie. Uh, I really just hate dishes, like doing dishes. Uh, so I will get takeout when I'm just like tired and don't want to do dishes. I'd much rather do that than do a sit down restaurant. Sometimes I will, but honestly, I'm happy with the Olive Garden because like when you're there, you're family. I, I, you could get you us know? on board with an Olive Garden. Right. You know, unlimited breadsticks and salad. You're welcome, Olive Garden. Amen. Yeah. This one's one's free. Next one's going to cost you. Yeah. (laughs) So I I do like kind of meet that need through uh, getting a latte or an iced coffee and just like kind of walking around places, just enjoying being alone. I think when you have two kids and uh, a husband that you enjoy spending time with, it, those pockets of time where you can be alone and I really value my alone time, they are rare. And so sometimes I will enjoy my aloneness by getting a coffee and being in there. And so I just like just being somewhere that is not with other people. So that is a, a value for me. But I also like community is one of my highest values too. And so that's a a reason I don't meet people very well. I am awkward. I don't meet them. I don't, don't I am not good at meeting people. (laughs) And so I need my lifelong friends. I, I'm sure I come across as cold to people who do not know me because I, just new people are weird to me and I wish that I was better at it. I work towards getting better at it. I don't let that be an excuse, but it is we just not my comfort zone. We need to have a meet zone. and greet with our book just so people can <laughs> yeah. experience it. Sometimes I hope this podcast will like, people will know me and then just, you know, meet me and be like, oh, I know you stink at this. So, hi, I'm so and so. <laughs> and I would love that. <laughs> So, so yeah, that kind of comes into the play with like lattes. It's not like I'm, I'm not even a coffee snob, honestly, like I'll, I'm good with Starbucks. And you've gotten so deep into the weeds on values-based spending that you can somehow connect latte purchases with being awkward upon meeting people. That is a true knowledge. I'm so deep. Wow. So deep. (laughs) You might be too deep. (laughs) I'm too yeah, vulnerable. I, I agree. I probably agree. <laughs> um, and then fitness. So like I I grew up with like really bad body dysmorphia and had a really like negative sense of self um, when it came to my appearance. And it's something that I still struggle with. Diet culture dies hard. And so I will pay money for gym membership, group training, fitness programs to not, I mean, I have overcome the the body dysmorphia to an extent, but I love feeling strong. I love feeling good about my body and, and kind of kicking that childhood, like shame about not being skinny, just like, punching it in the face. Mm -hmm. And so like now I was always 
as a child, I've I'm and as an adult, I am horrible at sports. Anything with a ball, I am horrible at and do not enjoy, uh, including frisbee. That is around, and <laughs> I'm hor- like, doesn't matter. It's a flat ball, and. And so I don't do that and I've never been good at it growing up. So I've, so I'm not, you know, quote unquote athletic, but in my adulthood, I have run half marathons. I have done CrossFit. Like I've done all these things and I feel so good about it. Like I feel it's something I'm bad at that I can make very small strides at and feel like they're big strides. Um, and because of the feeling that that gives me, that is definitely a value and something I will say yes to uh, pretty much without thinking. I do put some thought into it because that stuff can get expensive. I'm so proud of you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you. You'd be up in the gym just working on your fitness. I'm your witness. Ooh-wee. Thanks for listening. We love reading your kind reviews. It's one of our favorite pastimes and present times. And we especially loved this one. This is from Off Duty Dalek. This podcast lives in my subconscious is the title. I love the Frugal Friends podcast. It's helpful and educational and really enjoyable. I actually apply a lot of the advice in my everyday life, and I feel better about my money and how I spend it. I got life insurance because of this podcast. Thank you guys. Wow, well done. Side note, I have listened to so many episodes since discovering the podcast a few weeks ago that every time someone in conversation pauses for dramatic effect, my brain goes, the bill of the week, (laughs) 10 stars. Whoa, this was a good (laughs) review. I feel seen. I feel like we are friends. I don't think Jen would be awkward upon meeting you off-duty Dalek because this is... Jill, it's Dalek and all Dalek. of the nerds. How do you know? Um, is this it's a, a Doctor Who reference? Oh, yeah. I'm like, is it Star Wars? It's Doctor oh, Who. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's okay. Nerds and non nerds, we've got you covered. Thank you for listening. <laughs> uh, and we're going to need your book reviews. So get your typing fingers warmed up by leaving us a review on the podcast, um, on Apple Podcasts or wherever you can leave a rating and review because it helps potential new listeners know what the show is all about. And we want, I mean, we want them to know what they're getting into because if they don't like girls laughing, if they think it sounds like uh, vapid giggling, we don't want we don't want them here. We mm-hmm. want them to get you know what's more suited for they them. They don't belong here. Yeah, it would, they would be welcome here, but yes. if they are not going to like us, we want them to get what they will like. <laughs> um, and we know we're not for everyone, so please leave a rating and review and uh, and help us out there. See you next time. Frugal Friends is produced by Eric Siriani. Jen, I can't get over Frisbee is a flat ball. Frisbee's, Where's the lie? Know, Where is the lie? Oh, so good. I am vapid giggling over here because <laughs> I also liked your woven in high class word. And also, <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> Jen, we are not great influences on each other. Oh, gosh. But I do enjoy it. Actually, we are pretty good influences on each other. You make me want to be more generous and (laughs) and nicer to people. I think I so I signed up to bring that family a meal on their meal train that I didn't know. Yeah, because I was like, Jill would do this. And you are doing it. I knew you would. I knew you you would sign up. Well, yeah, but you also do have, you know, you've got two kids and one is very, a very recent child, very Mm -hmm. new human. So it would make sense if this is not. But I didn't do anything big. I just got some frozen ravioli and a, and a bottle of marinara. 
Had some, I love that. Put some ground beef in it, you know? I love that. It wasn't that. hard. Yeah, well so done. You make you influence me positively. It's probably me influencing no, you negatively. No, what I mean, no, you've influenced me very positively. And it's, <laughs> it's very obvious in the length of this podcast and a book and my financial life getting better. Um, I'm just thinking about last night, how we went to a game night with <laughs> friends together and we sat next to each other. And I've been thinking about it this morning. I'm like, I really made a point to be like, Jen's on my team because I knew we'd win. And we did. <laughs> both We games, did. We were so either good. Either one at... or both of us won. Yeah, we were so good. <laughs> um, but <laughs> I do wonder how it felt for the rest of the people there who haven't owned a business together for five years years and aren't whispering curse words to one another and trying to sabotage the other team with our own vapid giggling. (laughs) I'm just, I'm just wondering how the experience was for other people. And see, the fact that you thought about that means you are (laughs) such a better person than I am. And you influence me positively to think about. I was how the my one whispering the majority influence. of the curse words, so <laughs> I don't think you're the better one. <laughs> you have a cleaner mouth than me. To to each our own. <laughs> with the best all inclusive vacation deals to Mexico and the Caribbean, booking your getaway with cheap Caribbean vacations means you have more freedom to do your deal. Whether you want to enjoy snorkeling, endless margaritas, and more, or simply soak up the sun and sand in a tropical paradise, Cheap Caribbean Vacations has your deal for that. Plan and book the exact getaway you want at exactly the right price for you by using our exclusive budget Beach Finder. Or find a featured all inclusive package and do your deal at CheapCaribbean.com. Bring home Napoleon. Destiny has brought me here. The action epic from acclaimed director Ridley Scott. What is your name? Napoleon. You are the greatest leader in the history of the world. Witness the rise. You are nothing without me. Of the legend. Starring Academy Award winner Joaquin Phoenix and Vanessa Kirby. I'm the first to admit when I make a mistake. I simply never do. Napoleon. Buy or rent on digital now. Rated R.